Thank you. Uh, thanks a lot, Martin, for uh, for starting and engaging this discussion. Uh, so I'm taking over, presenting a bit more the, the research aspect of this collaboration. Um, and I would like to say it's been really um, a, a great pleasure to work together. And I think it's not that frequent to have the opportunity to interact that much and to, to get the insights from uh, the real world as researchers. So um, I think it's, yeah, it's been a great experience. Um, so I think I step, I'll take one step back um, and provide you slightly more uh, information on the emergence and the growth of these online uh, recruitment platforms uh, and how it has changed uh, the search behavior of people and the congestion on labor markets. So I think we know that, I mean, online labor markets are not new. They have grown a lot in the last 10 to 20 years. Uh, and just to give you two examples, uh, if you look at Upwork, which is one of the main uh, platform for freelance work, um, there are today's 12 million registered freelancers uh, on Upwork, which is a lot, and 5 million companies. If we look at Switzerland more specifically, uh, we know that roughly 40% of job seekers are now, uh, now looking for a job online and using these online uh, labor platforms. And so the development of these platforms means that we have transitioned from labor markets that were local where people were searching mostly for jobs within a geographic area, within their city, for instance, and they mostly had information about jobs within their city and within their area. And we're moving from this situation to global labor markets, where people are not uh, only getting information from jobs um, and searching for, from jobs that are close to them, um, but they're also looking at jobs and getting information on jobs that at the national level or even at beyond these, beyond their national borders. And so I think that this transition from local to global labor markets that is driven by online labor, uh, online labor markets and online recruitment platforms, this has obvious benefits. Um, and I think that Martin mentioned some of them. Um, it's reducing search costs for job seekers. It's reducing uh, screening costs for recruiters. And quite intuitively, if we have a larger and a thicker labor market, it's more likely that the match quality might be good in the sense that it's more likely that you will, uh, you will find the position that you were exactly looking at. Um, but on the, other, on the other hand, this enlargement of the labor market comes with some new challenges. Uh, and one of the challenges that is very often mentioned is the superstar effect. So superstar effect is very easy to understand. It's if you're an attractive recruiter, uh, historically, when the labor market is local, you used to be attractive within a kind of restricted area. So maybe you had 20 applications and other recruiters didn't have any application. Uh, and this was, you were a local superstar. When the labor markets are getting global, you're not a local superstar anymore, you become a global superstar. And this means that instead of having 20 applications, I'm just using a random example, uh, you might receive 100 applications or thousands of applications if you're the most attractive recruiter. And so quite obviously, this is creating inequalities, potentially raising inequalities, and this is generating congestion. So this is the, the point of this, of this talk. So what do we mean by congestion? If I'm using this example, so this is a very simplified version of the market where we have two candidates and six vacancies. Congestion would basically look like this. So all vacancies here, and I'm using an example where vacancies are, um, are contacting the candidates. So they are uh, inviting applications from candidates. I'm using this, it's slightly less conventional because when we think about labor market, we tend to think about candidates applying to positions. But given that in our context, the very nice feature of this platform is that it's completely symmetric and completely two-sided. So the vacancies also contact candidates. So the example I'm using through the presentation could be completely reversed and it would be the same. Um, but so basically, this is what a congested market would look like. And we have likely homogeneous preferences where everyone would prefer candidate one to candidate two, maybe because candidate one is more educated, for instance, and everyone would load a lot on education when they set up their preferences. On the other hand, we might have a less congested market or an uncongested market, and it, it would look like this. So the invitations to apply that the vacancies are sending to candidates would be more spread across <laughs> candidates. And so this would be uh, in a situation where we have more heterogeneous preferences. Um, and so congestion quite obviously uh, has a cost. And I think Martin also uh, mentioned some of this cost. It's increasing search time. 
It can reduce the number of matches because if everyone is starting by applying to the same position, it takes time to reject some of these candidates and that, so that these candidates can apply to the position they like slightly less. And so all these kind of application and rejections do take time. Uh, and it's also increasing mismatch. Mismatch in the sense that it's less likely that you will find the position that uh, is best suited for you. Um, and so I think these costs are kind of well known and well, I mean, we're not, uh, we're not inventing anything here. Uh, and because these costs have been identified, I think there is a literature that has looked at solutions to solve uh, this congestion. And so let me just briefly mention three sets of solutions because our paper is building on this literature and our initiative is building on this, uh, on this literature. So the first set of solutions consists um, in increasing application costs. So if you want to reduce congestion, you might want to discourage some of these vacancies from contacting these candidates and to re rebalance some of these contact requests to candidate two. One way to do this is to increase um, application costs. What does increasing application cost? Uh, it could be asking candidates, for instance, to submit a motivation letter. You make it more costly for people to apply. Another set of solutions consists in signaling. So instead of reducing the number of contact requests for a candidate, you keep it constant, but you try to get some information for, from some of these applications. And typically, you would like to know out of all these contact requests, are some of them more serious than others? So you would ask the vacancies to signal out of the 100 uh, contact requests you have sent, or some of them um, or some candidates particular, do you like some candidates particularly? Um, and finally, the last set uh, of, I mean, last set of uh, solutions would be to provide information to vacancies on the characteristics of the different candidates so that you diversify the, the, the invitations to apply. So typically, if vacancies previously only had information on, edu on the education level of the different candidates, if you pr also provide information on how far these uh, candidates are from yourself, uh, geographically, sp geographically, uh, geographically speaking, then perhaps you might diversify these preferences. And so what we do is to test a, th a new uh, and a different uh, solution to congestion. So we design a solution that is accounting for the preferences of both the job seekers and the recruiters. And so the intuition for that is quite easy. When we are in this situation of a congested market, we have too many um, invitations to apply sent by the vacancies to the candidates. And when we have this situation, it's quite likely that the candidate likes some of these vacancies, but doesn't like so much some other vacancies. And this is the information we would like to get. Instead of just discouraging all vacancies or some vacancies randomly from contacting this candidate, we would like to discourage the vacancies that this candidate doesn't like much. And this is where the preferences on both sides of the market is important. We need information on which vacancies this candidate likes most in order to discourage some of them. So we develop an algorithm that creates a popularity ranking for candidates and for recruiters or vacancies. And once we have this popularity ranking on both sides of the market, we show that it's actually doing a pretty good job at predicting contact mismatch. So what I mean by contact mismatch at the individual level is when a candidate is applying for a position, what's the probability that this application is accepted? And vice versa, when a vacancy is inviting a candidate to apply, what is the probability that this um, invitation uh, goes through and is accepted by the candidate? And then when we move at the market level, we show that this ranking is also a pretty good predictor of congestion. So let me just... So we use data for this project from uh, the Uture platform. And so because it's too fully symmetric and it's a two-sided platform, uh, we have roughly the same information on candidates and on recruiters. So on the candidate side, we have about 17,000 active job seekers on the, on the platform. And for these job seekers, we know the applications they send to recruiters. We know if this application was accepted or not. So ac accepted means 
roughly, that the recruiter has selected some applications as interesting applications out of the pool received. Um, we know also if uh, a candidate received an, an invitation to apply from a recruiter, if that invitation to apply was accepted or not. Um, and then we know all the steps of the recruitment process, plus some demographic information uh, from the candidates. And so we basically have the same information for vacancies. So we have slightly fewer vacancies, uh, 1,200 vacancies on the platform. And so we know if um, they sent invitations to apply to candidates, if these invitations to apply were accepted or not. And we know uh, the, the, the applications that vacancies receive and if they selected some of these applications are more interesting than others. Um, and so we also have information both for vacancies and for candidates on their uh, industries. Uh, so we can build, this is what we use to build the different markets that we will use to define congestion. So you see that we have um, different markets identified as communication and advertising, uh, construction and, and architecture, uh, consulting and accounting with varying um, varying numbers of vacancies and varying numbers of job seekers. And so now what I would like to show you is first that we do observe a fair amount of congestion, both for recruiters and for vacancies, and that this congestion has a cost. Um, so in terms of congestion, how do we measure congestion? That was one of the first questions we, we actually tried to, to answer. So if you look at this graph, the 45 degree lines is showing you, so on the x-axis you have the shear of vacancies and on the y-axis you have the shear of applications. So on these 45 degrees line, um, it would be the, the situation if 20% of the vacancies receive 20% of the applications, if 40% of the vacancies receive 40% of the applications. So this is this would be the situation of a market without congestion because all the applications are fully distributed between the different vacancies. This would be the market without congestion. Now, this is what the market looks like. And now here we are looking at the recruiter's side. So what the green line is showing you is the, the, the congestion level and the market level. And so what we see here is that 46% of the positions of the vacancies do not receive any application from candidates. And if we look at here, roughly 20% of the positions receive 70% of the applications. So this is kind of a evidence that there is congestion on this market. Now we can do the same exercise on the candidate side. If we look at the candidate side, so we have the same graph with the share of candidates uh, and the share of invitations to apply. And so what we see here, so first the situation without congestion here is not exactly the 45 degrees line. And the reason is that we have more candidates than invitations to apply. So by definition, we cannot have every single candidate cannot have an invitation to apply because we have uh, more candidates than invitations. Um, so this would be the situation, the red line would be the situation without congestion. And this is the Lorentz curve, uh, as we call it, as, uh, um, which shows that here 70% of the candidates do not receive any invitation to apply. And we still have uh, this difference between the two curves, which is indicating that there is congestion uh, on the candidate side as well. Now, the next interesting fact is if we compare the levels of congestion between different markets, we do observe that there is quite some variation between markets. So, for instance, the dark blue line here uh, on the candidate side is the level of congestion in the market for computer sciences. And we do observe that there is quite some congestion in the market for computer sciences compared to the market for mechanical, the market for care. It's slightly less the case for on the recruiter side, which was kind of interesting. But so there is some variation. And one question, I think, I mean, this raises the question of how do we explain this variation and can we reduce some of the, um, of the differences in congestion level between different markets? And finally, before explaining the algorithm, um, how congestion is costly um, in the sense that it's reducing the probability that an application would go to the second round. And we do observe on the, on the, on, on the platform that 14% of the candidates' applications move to the second round. And if we look at the recruiter's side, uh, we observe that 26% of the invitations to apply that are sent by the recruiters are accepted. So only 26%, in a sense, 
of invitations to apply are accepted by the candidates. So this is further evidence that uh, there is a cost, there seems to be a cost of congestion. Obviously, this is only descriptive statistics, but at least it's providing some uh, background descriptors. So now, how can we potentially reduce congestion? So we build a, a mutual popularity ranking that is based on an existing algorithm, which is the algorithm used by Google uh, to rank the different web pages. So Google is using PageRank <coughs> to rank the pages, and the intuition is, is actually pretty, pretty simple. Uh, they estimate the popularity ranking for websites based on two things, the number of links that arrive to a website and the popularity of the website that is linking to a website. So it's, this, it's a combination of these two informations. And so we use the same, I mean, we, we adapt this algorithm for the two-sided environment, and what we do is we use information on candidates and vacancies sending each other contact requests, so candidates uh, sending applications, whether they are accepted or not, and vacancies sending invitations to apply and whether they are accepted or not. And a candidate is popular if it gets many invitations to apply from popular vacancies. It's the combination of these two informations that build that or inputs into the, the the popularity ranking, and a re recruiter is popular if it gets many applications from popular candidates. And so this approach has been used by Isaac Sorkin to look at uh, the popularity of different companies, firms at the firm level in the US, you, you're looking at uh, mobility of workers between firms. And so we adapt this methodology to, um, to this two-sided environment. And so let me skip the illustration just to show you, because I think I have five minutes left. Five, yeah. So um, now the two questions is, we observe congestion in the market. We have a mutual popularity ranking, so a measure of the popularity on two sides. Does this ranking predict first at the individual level, does it predict contact mismatch? So the probability that the application of a candidate will be accepted or not, and the probability that an invitation to apply will be accepted or not? And does it predict congestion? So these are the two questions we look at next. Uh, and in order to look at uh, the predictive power of our ranking on contact mismatch, we standardize the rankings. So we have a ranking from zero to 100 for vacancies, and we have a ranking from zero to 100 for candidates. And so once we have the standardiza standardization, we build a relative ranking. So if a vacancy is ranked 65, it's pretty high, and a candidate is ranked 30, we have this relative ranking of 35. This is what we do. And now let me show you how this relative ranking predicts the probability that an application is accepted and the probability that an invitation to apply is accepted. So what we see on this graph, the blue line here, is we look at candidates applying to a position and conditional on, on applying, we look at the probability that this application is accepted. So it, the probability basically that the, the candidate is going to the second round of the recruitment process. And on the x-axis, we have the difference between the ranking of the job seekers and the ranking of the vacancies. So at zero here, it would mean that this is a candidate who applied to a position that has exactly the same popularity ranking as the candidate. When we're on that side, these are candidates who applied for positions that are uh, uh, where the candidate is more popular than the, than the position. And on that side, these are candidates applying for positions uh, where the candidate is less, uh, less popular than the, than the uh, position. And so what we see here, if we, what we did as a, as a descriptive exercise is we classify the candidates as those who send applications where their the ranking of the candidate is 25 points larger than the rank, ranking of the of the vacancy and candidates whose rank is 25 points lower than the rank of the vacancy and so what we see here is that if your rank is significantly larger as a candidate than the rank of the vacancy you have 26 percent chance on average to go to the second round of the recruitment process if you are contacting, um, if your rank is significantly lower, so you're contacting, you're overshooting, basically. You're contacting a, uh, a vacancy that is beyond your 
range, uh, your probability to move to the second round of the recruitment is significantly lower, is, it's 11%. We can do the same exercise on the other side of the market. So the green light is when a, job, uh, a vacancy is sending an invitation to apply to, uh, uh, to a job seeker, what's the probability that this application, that this invitation is accepted by the job seeker? And so same here, we see this decreasing uh, pattern where when uh, a vacancy is contacting a job seeker who is significantly less popular than the vacancy, the probability that this contact request is accepted would be 43% versus 31 if the vacancy is contacting a job seeker who is beyond reach, basically. So there, is, there seems to be quite strong predictive power in this relative ranking in terms of probability that uh, an application is accepted and probability that a contact request is accepted. Which means that as a side note, um, I mean, as a, as a, as a following uh, fact, if we were providing information to job seekers and recruiters on the relative ranking, this could potentially change their application behavior and potentially reduce contact mismatch. And this is what we will work on next. And then last two slides. So does the mutual popularity ranking predict market congestion? Now that we've looked at the individual level results, let's, let's look at the markets. And so what we do here is every dot here is a market. And we have the same axis on the x-axis where when we are beyond zero, these are markets where the candidates on average are more popular than the vacancies. And these are markets where the candidates are less popular than the vacancies. And so the first, this is showing us um, the average congestion at the market level. And so what we see is that markets where candidates are particularly attractive compared to the vacancies tend to be more congested for, for uh, candidates, which is kind of intuitive, um, but it shows that this, um, this ranking has a predictive power in terms of congestion, and we find the opposite um, and uh, as expected relationship for the congestion on the vacancies side, uh, where the, the markets where the candidates, where the vacancies are significantly more uh, popular than uh, the candidates, or markets where uh, there, there tends to be more congestion. Uh, on the recruiter's side. And so this is also kind of suggesting that if we change the application behavior uh, of the candidates or the application behavior, the contact behavior of the vacancies, um, providing information to job seekers and recruiters on the relative ranking could also reduce congestion because we know that there is a, a relationship now. Um, and so to conclude, I think in this paper, we develop an algorithm that creates a popularity ranking uh, on both sides of the market for candidates and for vacancies. We show that this popularity ranking uh, is an important predictor of both contact mismatch at the individual level and congestion at the market level. And so the next steps that we've been um, considering is to design a real life intervention uh, on the platform based on this popularity ranking in order to see if we can change the application behavior of the candidates, uh, impact, I mean, change, uh, affect, influence the, um, the application behavior, the, the mismatch at the individual level and the congestion. So thank you for attention. <laughs>